negotiation is both an art and a science, right? People talk about the art of negotiation. Well, but the art is, an, yes, it's, it's an art, but the art is not nearly as important as the science. When you learn some simple technique, they're simple, but they, they sound strange when you first hear them. But then when you realize you break them down, I, I've broken down into 52 different techniques that I use. They're simplified. And when, when, they're, when they're kind of simple, straightforward, and you can learn them step by step, you're learning the science behind negotiation. So it's why you're able to move people to the price that works, why you're able to convince them downwards as far as they're willing to go. And that's, that's, there's a science behind that, which is good news because if you're not particularly good at it or if you're afraid of negotiation or you don't like the sound of your voice on the phone, you don't have to worry about as much. That's the art side of it. The, your art will get better with practice and that will definitely make you better. But at the beginning, if you just learn to start spitting out the negotiation techniques uh, uh, like without worrying about the art side of it, you'll win because it's the science that's working. Who's this? Oh, you're an entrepreneur? Oh, you're a real estate investor? Oh, you're trying to learn from those who did it? Well, come into the lab then. Put your white coat on, gloves on, notepad, and let's build y'all. Real estate experiment, what is happening y'all? Today I have the pleasure of having another practitioner come into the lab and I'm very excited because right away I can usually tell by the first couple couple seconds that it's gonna be a good one based on the energy that I'm getting on the other side. So Tom, Zeeb, I want to welcome you to the lab here. We're doing it virtually. Uh, I'm here in Boston. I believe you're located in Florida, correct? Yep, Sarasota, Florida. Sarasota. Well, first of all, thank you for, for taking the time to come here. I'm just, you know, having connected, the first thing I told you is I love, you know, the way you've kind of, uh, I think branding is, here's my take on branding. Branding is what people say when you're not in your room. Marketing is what you put out to the marketplace, right? So I like what you've done with the brand, right? Traction, <laughs> real estate mentors, um, you know, from 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 spinning your wheels to to getting profitable deals. I love that. And I want to hear what I always go to is, you know, I do a lot of traveling myself. I'm, 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 I was telling you offline, I like to surround myself with other uh, individuals like yourself who have a knowledge of insight. But I always like to ask when I meet an investor, someone's kind of gone into the side of the, the consulting and the coaching and the podcasting because we value all this so much and we've had the ability to have an impact. When I meet you, what's the elevator pitch? If I were to meet you at the airport and say, hey, you know, Tom, what do you do for the living? What do you typically answer next to the individual that you meet? I help, I help real estate investors do more profitable deals or go from mm -hmm. spinning their wheels to doing more profitable deals. So you're a guy that we're very happy to, to have in the lab with us because in this day and age, I think one of the things you said offline is that you know negotiation is a big thing but I've, I've looked into your content looked into your stuff and i know one of the big pillars that you've talked about too is you know marketing uh getting to the yes right i think a lot of people struggle with that and then not being able to be not being able to uh, know how to deliver which um, i'm curious just to hear if you see those as kind of like separate things or kind of consolidated into one but tell, tell us about kind of you know, what you believe are some critical pillars right now that we should all be really honing our craft in or, or sharpening the ax in, uh, especially in this current economy during these times. And do you believe that it's any different uh, with your time uh, having been in the space yourself or it's actually more or less the same? Well, this is, I guess, the starting of a potentially and probably starting of, of another down cycle. So I've been through one before, like a, a big run up, then a dip, a run up again. And now I think we're coming down the backside of that. So is it majorly different? No. The base, look, I mean, could they, what do we deal with as real estate investors? Housing, shelter. Yeah. So yeah. food, clothing, shelter, basic human needs. We're in the shelter business. I think we're going to be just fine. Uh, in yeah. fact, I think we wind up as creative real estate investors, we wind up with more deals because motivated sellers have less options. They can't mm -hmm. just list the property and have it sell in, in three and a half seconds like it has been. Uh, they, they, need, they need people like us that can think through a problem, come up with a creative solution, do something a little bit different. So I think our time, our time is back, right? Our time is here coming again now, big league, and I'm happy about that. Then the first part of your question in terms of the pillars, yeah, I see three. And it doesn't matter which exit strategy. 
you, you want to do commercial, you want to do apartments, you want to do rehabs, you want to do wholesale, uh, you want to buy and hold, you want to, whatever it is, it, it, exit strategy doesn't matter. There's three pillars that all real estate businesses are based on. It's marketing, you got to find deals. You, you got to know how to make deals. So get people to say yes to you, how, mm -hmm. how to take a lukewarm lead and turn it into a red hot deal. That's all negotiation. That's the part I love the most. Uh, and then, yeah, contracts, control, getting paid. You got to know how to manage a deal through all the way to settlement and, and deal with those those conflicts uh, that come up along the way, the, the roadblocks, the hurdles. You got to be able to get through all of them so that you win, right? meaning you make money and you help your motivated seller in the process. Hmm. If you were to, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here. If you were to pick, and I know there isn't just one secret sauce, right? So I don't believe in that. Oh, what's the one thing that you do, Tom? Not necessarily, but what's the one that you you value the most and you think is, hey, listen, Ruben, if I was going to be really, 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 really good at one one of those three things, I'd pick that one and why? Yeah, I have to choose one. I got I got my first and my second. The The first one I would choose to get really good at is persuading people to say yes. Mm. What if it's not forcing them to say yes, not coercing them to say yes, persuading them to say yes, walking them through the process to understand to see if, if the problem I've pinpointed and the package I've built to solve the problem, if I can persuade them to say yes to that, because then they know, yeah, it's the best thing for them. And then it also happens to be the best thing for me. So we both win. It's a, it's a classic win-win scenario, which some yeah. people say is corny and doesn't work. That's what I choose as my number one. You know, it's funny that you say that, Tom, because I've always, anytime this comes up and it just doesn't, doesn't come up every day. So it's kind of an interesting conversation. I would say like, if you had one superpower, Ruben, what would it be? And I always say, and, and, and in a way I kind of do this because I read about this stuff too. And I'm curious to hear what you got or, or kind of like how you dive in and sink your teeth in into this topic. But, uh, I always say, uh, the, the power to uh, convince, I think is the word that I use, because I think if you can convince someone to sell to you, pick your services, invest with you, partner with you. I think the world is yours. If you have that, if you, if I were to pick for one part of superpower, it would be the power to convince. convince. So now let me ask you, Tom, right? The million dollar question. What are some ways that we can get better at having the ability to uh, get to the yes I think I heard you speak about it a little bit about listening, but I'm not sure if you were going to go there. So I'm not going to. That's I'm fine. I'm going to try to money the water. What do you, what do you use your take on that? So combination of factors. The, the first principle I, I want everyone to understand, and, and it's good news, it, negotiation is both an art and a science, right? People talk mm. about the art of negotiation. Well, but the art isn't, yes, it's, it's an art, but the art is not nearly as important as the science. When you learn some, Simple technique. They're simple, but they, they sound strange when you first hear them. But then when you realize you break them down, I, I've broken down into 52 different techniques that I use. They're simplified. And when, when they're when they're kind of simple, straightforward, and you can learn them step by step, you're learning the science behind negotiation. So it's why you're able to move people to the price that works, why you're able to convince them downwards as far as they're willing to go. And that, that, there's a science behind that, which is good news because if you're not particularly good at it or if you're afraid of negotiation or you don't like the sound of your voice on the phone, you don't have to worry about as much. That's the art side of it. The, your art will get better with practice and that will definitely make you better. But at the beginning, if you just learn to start spitting out the negotiation techniques uh, uh, like without worrying about the art side of it, you'll win because it's the science that's working. Okay. This is so interesting. So when you say, Tom, science, are you saying that there is some kind of, just because that science is, is so ambiguous and I want to just get yeah. granular. We hear it sometimes, right? Are we talking about like these psychological reactions, precursors? What exactly, when you say, when you say science, because maybe someone hears yeah. science and they think of one thing, but when you say science, what do you mean if you're, where to get a little bit more granular, what does it mean to you, the science behind negotiation? Human behavior, specifically mm. some, some, some psychology, some standard ways that people respond that if you learn them, you'll see the patterns in people. So for example, Ruben, um, <clears throat> say a number. Ooh, five. Five, wow, that's a lot. Now, mm. what's the first thought in your mind? That's... I, I, to your reaction yeah damn maybe it is maybe it is high 
Maybe it is high. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. You're feeling a little uncomfortable about your own yeah. number yeah. But because I did something called a flinch. So I flinched mm -hmm. at your number. Now, flinching is my all time favorite negotiation technique. So I flinch and you're uncomfortable with your number. It must be too high. Why? Yeah. Because I flinched. I, I just said, say a number. I don't know what we're talking about. I didn't say a price of a house or a car or a boat or anything. I just say a number and you're uncomfortable with it. That, that's a really predictable mm. human reaction. So when you start to learn that, you realize that if you flinch every time you hear a number, you're putting <laughs> those thoughts and feelings into somebody and it softens them up so that you can start moving the price in the right direction for you. Wow. <laughs> is this the same stuff as like uh, NLP and all that stuff? Yeah, they're probably tangentially related. A NLP, mm -hmm. uh, acronym for Neuro Linguistic Programming. Uh, that was like a subset of psychology that helped people with trauma. And and there, there's some stuff in there that's valuable, uh, mm -hmm. like anchoring and whatnot. Uh, then there's some stuff that I think when people read into it, it gets a little too foo-foo for, for for my taste, at least. So some of it's solid and reasonable. I don't think it's the magic ninja trick or the chokehold that everyone wants to think it is. Uh, I, I, I just like some straightforward, fun, uh, clean negotiation skills. Mm. Okay. So what do you think, you know, and, and, and def I'm definitely going to reverse engineer back into this, uh, you know, but, but we're, I want to strike while the iron's hot too, because we're on this topic. So what do you think is the, the biggest uh, most common we talk about you know the science right the flinch that was a great example you know where do we make a lot of common mistakes right and like i just picked up i'm getting spam calls all the time <laughs> i got a call and i'm like automatically man you got like three seconds to make it hot man or yeah. else it's just you know so i get it you know and and and, and but at the same time i i see that there's a lot of it a lot of these calls maybe coming in, they sound the same, etc. So maybe there's something there. What what do you when you analyze? And I know there's a big topic on this, and this is kind of like what you're you, you know you specialize in. So don't want to simplify it. But what are some of the areas you feel that a lot of us could use some work when it comes down to the human behavior of again negotiation, just one on one biggest yeah. mistake we continue to make over and over again what do you see i think most people are too boring mm. they, they really come across canned and you're right when you're getting hammered by spam and spam calls non-stop and strange numbers on your caller id it, it's boring you're like everybody else so that ability to learn to stand out a little bit sometimes it might be with something funny well, you gotta be careful not everyone can not everyone can do humor right most of the time i think the safest bet is is to provoke curiosity in the other person so mm. why are they calling me right curiosity killed the cat curiosity will drag you in and, and mm. you know, so if i'm calling about a property it's it's I, I don't leave a detailed message it's hey my name's tom i've got a question uh, about your property over there at 123 main street uh, and then i leave my phone number i don't say hi i'm tom i'm an investor and i want to buy a property for i'm going to make you a great offer please call me back because yeah. They're never going to call back. That's obviously a sales call. No, nobody has time for that crap anymore. So yeah. it would be a little more uh, teasing and, and mm -hmm. tease and, and hold back the information, tease and create curiosity so, so that they want to contact you and they want to call you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tom, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pull this up on my phone here so I have it because this, this gentleman, yeah. I've been meaning to like lean into his content a little bit more. But do you know who Jeremy, is it Jeremy Miner? No. Oh, gosh. I'm going to pull it up here. I'm going to hopefully find it and I make sure I don't butcher his name. But this gentleman said something uh, very interesting. Um, and he, he kind of was just like, wow, that, that was a really good one. Um, and his whole thing was, I'm, I'm just going to pull it up. Jeremy, yeah, Jeremy Miner. Or Miner is the the seventh level HQ team. Anyways, he, I think he said this on, on a podcast. It was pretty fascinating on, on, on the topic that you're speaking of. And he's like, uh, the way he'll call in and he'll say, Hey, I'm looking at, uh, your, uh, your, your, your tax records for this. Uh, um, and he'll say the address and I'm hoping you can help me. And <laughs> that, you know, in itself, it's like, okay wait why are you looking at my tax records and who is this and is there something wrong like am i behind on my taxes right it kind of opens up the that opening of 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 so many areas that would maybe 
create some level of concern or interest. Yeah. Uh, wasn't sure what you thought about that kind of opening, if you had heard of it before. Yeah, off the cuff. I mean, it certainly creates a little curiosity, although I think it also has a bit of a negative edge to it. You know, you're calling mm-hmm. about my tax record. It, you, you sound like a debt collector in a way, rather than maybe someone uh, out to help. So I, I think there's things you can say that either are gives or takes, and you're mm-hmm. usually better off as a give rather than a take. Because uh, people have their intent up for, uh, you know, selfish reasons. And if they think you're just out all in it for yourself or for, for your selfish reasons rather than being out there for them, they're less likely to respond. So, that again, there's some curiosity there, but it's got a, a slightly negative uh, edge to it, is, is my first impression. Yeah, Tom, do you think that there's this thing where we almost kind of start overthinking? When I say we, I'm thinking we're primed now to think, okay, there's no way Tom has my best interest. What's the catch? This is too good to be true. So do you almost want to like reverse engineer that? Hey, listen, let me tell you why this is. Let me tell you actually why I'm calling and how I make money. Right. Because it's like it's almost to the point like I feel like we've become so skeptical of like scams of anything mm-hmm. that like I almost wonder if there's like this. We, we need to start playing chess with the way we approach people because we already know that they're, they're they're on their guard and they're thinking, well, there's no way you're just calling because you care, Tom. What, what's your take on that? And how do you, how do you see that? Do you think that the, the primal brain is actually even thinking that ahead or that actually Ruben, just keep it simple. And trust me, people will just resonate with you keeping it simple. Like, am I overthinking this thing? Help me out here, Tom. Well, look, I, I, I think it's correct that people's guard is up more than it ever has been. Mm-hmm. But that being said, it's not hard to, I don't want to say get their guard down, but at least get them to put the offensive weapons away so, so that they're not attacking you and bring their defensive shields down a little bit so they'll talk to you. And a lot of that is just build rapport. And you build rapport by talking and, as you mentioned earlier, listening. You heard me talk about people just need to listen. Mm. It, it, it's so true. When you ask a question, keep the conversation about them. They, they don't really care about you. They don't care about uh, you know your company name or why you chose it or what your favorite color. I mean, nobody cares. They only want to talk about themselves and specifically their problems. Now, you know, if you think about it, most people can talk about their problems all day long. So yeah. let them because get get focused in there and dwell on those problems. You kind of dig up the pain. And then what you want to do is explain, you know, get them to imagine what the future is like without those problems anymore. Mm. And then the thing that connects the dots is you. You're the one that's going to solve the problem. You're the one that's going to make that future into a reality. You're the one that's going to take the pain of today away by making that future real. So you're, you're future pacing them would be the technical term. So you, you're showing them what it could be and making sure they understand that you can provide that solution. And so the fact that they've told everything to you, they, there's a level of trust. And, and they, the more they've talked, the more rapport they've built with you. Mm. That's so good. I love that. That's it's it's we hear it often and we forget and we make it about us. It's like, hey, here's why I'm calling and why I and and it's like, hold on, hold the phone there. Tom, let's take a step back because I wanted to reverse engineer. I always like to kind of just go where kind of what matters to you. And I love how you kind of really focused on getting to the yes and the negotiation. I'm right there with you. Um, I'm curious though, how did we get here, Tom? Like, what's the story with respect to your time? I'm speaking of asking people questions and about themselves, right? Uh-huh. This is about you, right? See, I'm learning Gosh, on the you fly. Want, you want me to open up and tell you my story? <laughs> what is the story here? So how did we get into this space? And and how did you start figuring out if we reverse engineer that this skill set was important? What problem were you trying to solve for you? Well, at the time that I started studying negotiation and focusing specifically on that part of my business. It was because I, I had such a good taste of what real estate deals were doing for me financially. Mm. After having been through the ringer of, you know, I, I had gotten out of college and probably worked for four or five years at jobs that I sometimes enjoyed, but didn't particularly love, if you know what I mean. They were okay for a while, then they weren't, you know, they were good until they weren't. Uh, and I was constantly frustrated by not being able to have more like if if I worked harder and and was you know was better at what I did, I made the same amount of money. If I did no work and sat around and was lazy, I made the same amount of money. That, what that, kind of work were you in? Uh, <laughs> it was a cross between IT and political yep. consulting. So we did software, mm. lobbyists, and government affairs divisions of corporations. It was some of that was interesting. 
Uh, and some of it was very technical and some of it was clinical and some of it was sales driven. Some of it was op operations driven. Uh, but either way, it was a job. And I, and I, I, the thing that frustrated me, Ruben, was I realized I wanted to be off on my own. I needed to be mm -hmm. on my own. I wanted to be on my own. The problem was I never freaking clue how. Can I? So, Tom, let me let me ask you about this, because I always wonder, like. Do, was it progressively over time because my whole brand is about experiment fail learn repeat right so was it more like you went down this path that hey listen i want to do this it or uh, political kind of consulting and then you kind of grew out of it or was it more like you've always had this itch of wanting to do your own thing and and again i don't think those are exclusive but i'm just curious because yeah. to hear the evolution of kind of the yeah. entrepreneurship and kind of biting the the uh yeah yeah, the, the itch was always there, yet I never had a clue what the path would be or should be or was going to be. And so you know, I went to college. I, I studied history and political science. Now, what does that tell you about me? It tells you I had no freaking clue what I wanted to do for a living. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Right. You know, people that want to, They know they want to be an engineer. They know they want to be a doctor. They know they want to be a, an astronaut. I, I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. I, I, so I was just going along to get along. You go, you get your degree, you move ahead. Okay. I, I, I took a job. Great. They offered me a job. Great. I got a job. Uh, and then it was, I still didn't know what do I really want to do? And, you know, you start progressing through your early twenties, you start hitting your mid twenties and you're going, I still don't get it. What do I want to be when I grow up? And, and it's, it's a very odd feeling. Uh, yeah. And then when I finally went off on my own, everything started to change. Like I was very, fascinated now by my work and my effort, but which was my business, not even work anymore. I was fascinated by my business and I loved helping motivated sellers. And I loved doing the deals because I was loving the cash that was coming in from these deals. And I was on my own and I had all this free time. And this is the early 2000s. So, you know, it, like barely working and being able to work remotely, that wasn't quite the big thing. Like, you know, everybody does it now. Back then it was difficult. You know, you had to, you had to know some technical stuff about computers to get them to work other places and most people weren't carrying laptops and you didn't have smartphones and all that. And so it was, but I, I was able to set myself free, uh, not just financially, but also like I didn't have to be strapped down to one location. And so mm -hmm. I started doing what I love to do and that's travel the world and just go random places and yet keep my real estate deals going because nobody had to know I was gone. I, I usually found that if I told somebody I was gone, uh, it was really bad because they assumed if I was out of town, I was out of touch. I'm thinking, no, 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 I can reach out and strike from anywhere. <laughs> you'll, never mm -hmm. know, you'll never know that I'm gone as long as I don't tell you. And this is the days before social media and all that. We got all the, yeah. now there's all these things that kind of hint that you're gone. And I, I, I never liked that. Wait, tell me, so what kind of, what kind of deals are these? Like, what was the first deal that you did? And, and, and tell us about how you kind of structured that. Yeah. Well, my, my first deal was actually a complete disaster. The deal that got me started and got me out of my job uh, nearly drowned me uh, in, in, in just a, a giant pool of stupidity. <laughs> I mean, I, my, my, my first quote unquote deal was a mm -hmm. six unit building in Brooklyn, New York. Ooh. And I knew nothing really about real estate. I had read one book. I read rich dad, poor dad by Robert Kiyosaki, which is a phenomenal book. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I love that book, but it doesn't really give you any how to, <laughs> you know, there's, there's no nuts and bolts. Uh, yeah. it, it, and so I, I just dove in head first. This is what I'm going to do. And I wound up with, it was a deal I, I did with my sister because I gave her, her the book and she caught the same fever. And we, and we bought this place in, in New York City, landlord friendly New York City. And we wound up with six tenants that weren't paying a dime. You're being sarcastic about the landlord friendly, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because oh, I, I don't was, know if back <laughs> then things had changed, but yikes. So yeah. Man, that's that's crazy. So that first of all, that's so important, right? I guess the market matters, right? Because to your <laughs> point, for those who, who don't know, uh, New York is a very very tenant friendly state, uh, right? Yes, tenant, uh, tenant friendly, not not owner landlord friendly. Yeah, yeah. So which I, I guess kind of paints the story of how that happened. So you 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 got a six unit in Brooklyn. Wow, I mean that's. That's no small fee. I mean, back then the prices were still pretty high, no? Uh, high, but not as high as they are now. Yeah. Uh, we spent, I think, 450000 on it. Wow. And I was dead broke. 
But remember, this is, this is what, 2001? So the, yeah. the mortgage application was a joke. I mean, as long as I could fog a mirror and prove I was alive, they forked over 450 grand, no questions asked. I mean, gosh, I can't imagine why we wound up in the great financial crisis of 2008. Because, you know, they had been giving mortgages to morons like me all that time. <laughs> so so, so where, where did you go wrong? Where did you go wrong? Because obviously you said they, they stopped paying, which is technically that's, I don't know if anyone, maybe you, you could forecast that into your numbers, but in retrospect, where did you go wrong? Uh, my due diligence was non-existent or incorrect. I didn't have the right team members. There were a number of issues that were coming up kind of on the way to settlement. And yet I was ignoring them because I just wanted the deal. All the team members were ignoring them because they just wanted to get the deal done so they can get their commissions or their payments or their fees. And so everybody's uh, actively putting blinders on and ignoring all the troubles and just focusing on getting the deal done rather than, is this actually a good thing for me? Uh, and, and myself included in that. I'm not just blaming the others. It was it was every bit my fault. So the fact that that almost took me under uh, was, you know, my own doing this time, at least. But I've got a hard enough head that I got through it. And I started uh, during that time. I had found my local real estate investors association, a, mm -hmm. a, a group that I'm now president of and run. But back then I was I was, you know, I was a member. I walked in as a guest, just wandered in. I go, let's see what this is. I'm like, wow, all this stuff in those books is actually true. These people actually do it. That's incredible. And so I, I watched what they were doing and I decided to market close to the home. I, I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time. The, the reason I went to New York City is my sister lives there. Uh, we're both from upstate New York. We're from Buffalo. Uh, but, you know, so I, we did deal in, in her neck of the woods. Then I said, let me focus closer to my neck of the woods. And I, I started focusing on something totally different. Uh, got some serious marketing out there. And my first two deals came through and the, the first one paid me almost 23 grand and the second one paid me five. And mm. uh, I wound up where I thought I was going to rehab them. I wound up wholesaling both of them, even though you know, a few moments earlier, I didn't even know what that term meant. But wholesaling meant I assigned away my position and somebody else came in and took over. So instead of me rehabbing it, a rehabber came in and took over and paid me for it. And so, I mean, that was, that was what, almost 28 grand on my first two deals. It was nuts. It changed everything for me. Experiment Nation, you've heard the word MTR, midterm rentals, as it is currently a hot topic and hot commodity right now, because again, there has been an increase in short-term rental regulations. And there also has been, let's face it, a slowdown in what we were experiencing a couple years back when it comes to bookings. So with that said, short-term rental operators are looking for alternative solutions to tap into the midterm rental space. However, there is a space, there is a sub niche of midterm rental insurance that I'm truly excited about that I want to share with you that the experience that we've had, the tremendous results we've been able to have, and that's the insurance midterm rental space, which is very different than your traditional midterm rentals. Or when you think of traditionally midterm rentals, you think of travel nurses. There is a space, midterm rental insurance space that we've tapped in where you need to be well connected with insurance and relocation specialists and companies and understand the right type of asset required for you to be able to help these families. What's really important that stands out the most, which you can get in what I'm about to offer you is the understanding where to be found by these insurance companies, how to properly manage your calendar so that your listings are optimized so that they can find you, how to actually gain traction and build a relationship with these relocation insurance companies. I've put together an MTR insurance blueprint. That's double M T triple R insurance blueprint to cover these foundations after we've had success landing very large contracts on single family homes that literally 4x what we traditionally make in long-term rentals and also gives us peace of mind because there's less turnover and a hundred percent occupancy because these contracts can start anywhere from 30 days to three months to eight months and range anywhere from again we've landed anywhere from eight thousand to nine thousand dollars a month in per month on a single family home property which our mortgages are typically around a 2400 range which then gives you a large spread of anywhere from four to six k net on just one property and this is why it's very hot right now but 
people who haven't been in the lab with individuals like myself, like Jesse Vasquez and Dr. Rachel Gainsborough and Noble Crawford don't have the foundations and don't know exactly where to start. And therefore, this is why I'm giving you guys a blueprint, the MTRR insurance blueprint. Go to the website, experimentrealestate.com and get yourself a blueprint to completely change or at least have a plan B if you're a short-term rental operator looking to maximize your occupancy and profitability we'll see you on the other side wow and and i love that because sometimes it's just planting the seed or or at least what what occurred was a proof of concept that you didn't double down on yeah uh how did you, who planted that seed how did you seek that where where did that insight come from you went from a six unit that was went completely you know kind of <laughs> in the other direction that you wanted to go what was that next kind of, okay, I'm going to try this. And what did that look like? How, how did you get that intuition or uh, inspiration to get into wholesaling? Yeah, I'm not sure the intuition was there quite yet. Uh, inspiration, sure. Yeah, it, it was going uh, going to the, the my local real estate investors association, the, the local RIA. That there were real people there doing real deals. And so being able to rub elbows with them and ask questions and, and generally finding a very welcoming mentality. I mean, people weren't mm. afraid to talk about their success or how to have success. And they were happy to kind of, you know, take you, you know, steer you by the elbow kind of thing and and, and, and move you up. You know, you go some places and people are very defensive and don't want to share and don't want to talk. Uh, but I found people very welcoming and, and happy to share. So it was kind of, kind of like standing on the shoulders of giants. It, it was a good thing. Yeah. You know, it's funny, Tom, I, I, I find there's a very significant difference when you go from corporate to entrepreneurship slash real estate, you know, it's unbelievable. Like I've been in masterminds on just on the entrepreneurial side where showing your balance sheet is the point, right? You, you want to measure and you know what you can measure and then it opens up the mind that it's possible. Whereas in corporate, it's more like no one knows what anyone's making. It's like a hidden thing. And it's like, it's complete night and day, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's sharp yeah. elbows and people pushing them in your face and trying to outdo each other. Where entrepreneurship, if anything, you're you're talking about what you make because you're you're keeping score and you're 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 generating a competitive spirit in the others, but a friendly competition, right. not to smack them down and make it so they can't. But just it's it's kind of nice to be in a in a sprint yeah. with somebody else, and then you both win when you get to the finish line. So yeah. it, it's it, it's it's cool that way. I I, I like the the community of real estate investors, specifically the ones that attend RIA groups. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And, and essentially what it is, is, is it's a group of like-minded individuals who are kind of headed towards a, a very similar direction with that, in, that abundant state of mind. And I feel like being surrounded by those people along the way is, are the right people that are going to help you kind of uh, show your blind spots and, and instill some of that inspiration. Um, so that's fascinating. I'm so glad you're bringing that point home because there are some of my core values that I really believe in. Um, so you kind of, so you evolved. So what happened next in the next couple of years? Because you know, traction real estate mentors came, and obviously you had a proof proven track record. But where did that uh, a proven track record come from? Was it strictly uh, wholesaling, or did it kind of? going to another direction as well or you know what tell me a little bit about kind of that trajectory since way back in like the early 2000s to now being 2023 yeah i i kept i kept solely as wholesaler for quite a long time mm. um it, it it fit my personality i i don't like long drawn out projects maybe i'm a little add right i want to i i want to get in and out of the deal get my money and move on uh, I, I don't like things that go on for months and months. So wholesaling fit me like a glove. Eventually though, uh, I got I got over the distaste of the six unit building. And uh, you know, there was a point where I was married and had kids and I was like, all right, well maybe, maybe you know, some uh, uh, steady income from rents is a nice thing. Uh, the, the wealth appreciation uh, from, the, from a property improving in value is a good thing. Uh, and at a certain point also, one of the one of the people I trained was also a contractor. He was a great contractor. So now oh, I got a good contractor. We'll do some. Let's do some rehab sometimes to go for those bigger bucks. So uh, occasionally I'll venture off into the other exit strategies. Uh, and then I usually want to circle right back to where I feel uh, best at home. Mm -hmm. And that's wholesaling. That, that, that's different for everyone, right? That's my story. But no, it, no. I, everyone I, can I, do what they please. I love that you went there because 
I truly believe, I mean, I've, I've described this before when I talk about experiment and, you know, I believe it's kind of like this, I have this analogy that's like, it's kind of like an hourglass. When I think of people who get the most strides and gains, they really like specialize and niche into one thing. And they, again, they can keep, continue to sharpen the ax, right? Over and over again. And then once they've gotten really, really good at that, should they feel that they want to, you know, diversify for lack of a better word, then they do because they can, because they have this high skill set that they're able to kind of pour their, their successful experiments into these other avenues. Um, do you see it that way? Or do you see it another way? Uh, I know that again, you can go to these Rio groups and there's a lot of people doing a lot of different things. So yeah. what would you say to someone who's listening, who's looking to gain traction? What's the best way for, for someone to gain traction? Is it try a lot of different things and see which one it sticks and, do, and, and the one you get traction with or stick with one thing and then later on try to kind of uh, diversify? Like what do you suggest in this, uh, in this time and day and time of how, how one is to best gain traction? Yeah. Great question. I, I tell people, I said, look, le learn a little bit of everything, you know, cross train at the beginning to get, get a sense of what's out there. Mm -hmm. Some things you're going to look at and go, yeah, I can never see myself doing that. Well, well good. You learned something. So you learn that that's not you. And, and then there's other things where for whatever reason, you're really interested in that. You can see yourself doing that. Well, mm -hmm. good. You can follow that path and then compare that by looking in the mirror, look at yourself in the mirror and be honest. Wait, what are you good at? What do you stink at? What, what do you need right now? What do you want right now? What do you need in the future? What do you want in the future? And and and, and then match that to the exit strategy. If you're if you, if if you're broke as a joke like I was, you, probably a cash flowing rental isn't the right thing right now because the, mm -hmm. you know, it, it could cut both ways. If it starts racking up expenses, you'd be better off with wholesaling, bringing in some fast cash. Now, if if you've got a decent nest egg or retirement account, or you're just retired out of a of a job after you know 20 years in it and you're still you know you're just you know, midlife and you're looking for something a second half life career well maybe go for the rehab and go for the big bucks you're fine because you can cushion it so it look at the types of money that the different exit strategies make and choose mm. which one works for you now and which one do you want let's say in three years time from now and mm. and there's nothing wrong with understanding that there's a transition plan there I love that answer. <laughs> no, it's because I think part of the trouble too, Tom, is there's a lot of mixed messages out there. And obviously there's a lot of consulting. Right? I think you and I do both consulting, coaching, and I think it's it behooves us to to tell tell it like it is, right? It's it's not that my method is better than Tom's method. I think there's two pieces there that people miss often, right? Right. You'll often hear the beginner. And I just the reason I'm bringing this up, I want to just just piggyback slash bring bring the point home. If you didn't hear Tom say it, I mean, let's just let's just kind of put our minds together here and let's see if you kind of agree with this. And and I know you do because you said it, but I want to bring the point <laughs> home here. So it's there's two points, right? One is where are you now? Right. That matters. It's like, where are you now? Because sometimes people will come and say, hey, you know what? What, uh, I want to get in real estate. All right. Well, that I don't know your situation, right? Are you a? And then another one is your skill set, etc. So, first of all, where are you now, right? Because that will I have a good buddy of mine who says that will determine then you know what you can do, what your options are, and then once you use that as a stepping stone, I love how you said that that what is your future. So you start with the now, and then you go with the future, right? And then the other thing I think that I heard you say, and, and I've heard you say as to why you're in real uh, into wholesaling is because you love to actually do the negotiation. Like you like that. So what, and you're good at it. And because you like, you're good at it, you like it. Right. And it's kind of yeah. this feedback loop. Right. I mean, that's, I, I love how you said that because it, I think it's so important to be able to put it in that order. And I think often we miss that order, especially in this world where there's a lot of noise, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Filtering out the noise is important. What, what, what fits you like a club? Everyone ought to be asking themselves that. What do you really want to do? What would get you kind of ginned up and excited? What would, what would get you jumping out of bed in the morning versus hitting snooze for the 11th time? You know, what, what, what's going to what's gonna draw you ahead? Go with that. 
and, and start with that now. And if, and if you go, but in the future, I need something different. Well, great. Then you can move towards what you need in the future. Maybe you're not able to do that right now. So there's nothing wrong with, 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 with having an idea for the future, but you still have to have an idea of how do you start today? Then you can make the bridge to the future. And it's that same skill set. No matter what you want to do now or in the future, you need to learn how to find deals, how to make deals, and how to get paid. Amen to that. So, Tom, do you think that um, you've been in multiple different cycles? We're currently re recording this in Q4 2023. Uh, so I'm just curious. I know I opened up the the, 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 the show with this question, and I kind of want to just put a bow on it. We talked about marketing. We talked about getting to the yes, and then we talked about having the skill sets to actually be able to uh, you know, bring, bring the deal home. Um, in this economy right now, you know, interest rates are high, you know, we just did a creative finance deal, like a sub two deal. Uh, you know, what, you know, what is the, uh, the way for us to, or where do you see the opportunity? Right. And then the reason I'm asking you is your season, if you've been around the block, right. This is not your first rodeo. Where do you see an opportunity as far as the traction goes? Do you see that the wholesale deals are actually now, you know, you're, we're going to be seeing a little bit more of them now that the, you know, times are changing. You, you see things are a little bit slow and therefore if they are, you know, you know, here's where you should be kind of focusing and paying attention to what, what's kind of your, your landscape or, or I guess your eyes on, on the, on the landscape of what's happening today to maybe help someone who's kind of going through it. Maybe do I put gas on, you know, do I, do, do I step on the gas or do I actually let, let my foot off the gas and, and yeah. focus my energy on, on something else? Like again, all around the traction in this economy, what are your thoughts? Yep. Well, this is one of those things, you know, talk about filtering out the noise. The, the, mm -hmm. All this, all this hubbub out there, all this flap about, oh, the market's slowing down, things are going slow. I'm going, well, okay, if the retail market's going slow, I'm a okay with that. That means that truly motivated sellers are going to need me more than ever. And like I said earlier, if, if they can't just list their property and and sell it in in three, four, or five seconds, or three, four, five days, as the case may have been, it, then they need me more than ever. And the reason why, no matter what happens in the economy, no matter how fast or slow things go, people still need housing, right? Food, clothing, shelter. We're in the shelter business. So th they need us. And things always change because houses get run down. You know, it gets mm -hmm. cold in the winter, everything contracts, but then it gets hot in the summer, everything expands. Expand, contract, expand, contract, break. It, it, things go out of style. Roofs break, toilets break, tenants flake out. People get old and pass away and leave their houses behind. People start to grow up, have families, and no, no longer have enough space and need a bigger house. Uh, or their kids grow up, get out of the house, they need a smaller house. Uh, people get into divorce. People are tired landlords. They're, they're sick and tired of evicting. There's all these different things that motivate people. None of that changes just because the economy is getting slower or quieter. None of that changes just because interest rates are two to three times what they used to be. It, it doesn't matter. What, what, I think we're in a very safe space because we're needed no matter what. Mm, I love that. And then, and for someone who may not be kind of fully understand the, the full picture, I'm like, I heard them say in the beginning wholesale, but can you just kind of at a very high level for those who are not familiar with the, you know, whole oh, yeah. you know, finding a deal, marketing, you know, assigning, can you just tell us at a thousand foot view of what, what it is and why there's an opportunity and why is it almost, I would say, uh, it, timeless, yeah. uh to to be in this opportunity yeah gotcha so for uh, i'll define wholesaling because yeah people may not it's a weird word in real estate but uh, like let me ask you this ruben what do rehabbers get wrapped up doing uh flipping homes yeah yeah, yeah rehabbing them and flipping them what do mm -hmm. landlords get wrapped up doing um uh, i guess either f trying to get tenants trying to increase the deferred maintenance. I mean, there's multiple things there. Yeah. yeah. Managing the properties, right? You know, Manage they properties. get wrapped up in tenants and toilets. So they all class. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Well, when the rat, if the rehab is wrapped up rehabbing, the landlords wrapped up landlording, what are mm -hmm. they not focused on? They're not focused on marketing to find yep. more deals. So mm -hmm. where a wholesaler comes into play is I, I focus intensely on my marketing and intensely on my negotiation. But when I get a property under contract, Instead of closing it, uh, instead of closing on it myself, instead of me buying it, I, I reach out to a rehab or a landlord who's ever appropriate for that deal. 
and I say, would you like to take over my position? Hmm. And they go to settlement for me. They show up the money. They buy the property. Then they rehab it or then they landlord it. Or they can do whatever they want after they buy it. But, but they pay me to take over my position in the property. That's wholesaling in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's and it's uh, it's fascinating because, you know, you want to talk about what you talked about uh, in the beginning where, you know, you can put in a lot of work and get rewarded for it. And there's really I mean, there is no ceiling. Right. Uh, which is it's pretty fascinating. Let me ask you actually what well, fun, fun fact, fun question. What's the largest kind of spread? you've ever gotten on a wholesale deal and, and, you know, what's typically average. And I know you have a community of, as well that you have mentees and um, that you, that you coach and, yeah. and help. So I'd love to hear just so someone who's listening would be like, Oh, hold on. Now that I got my attention. <laughs> on the, on, on, let's talk the big number first, biggest wholesale fee I've ever had assignment fee. So ho- mm-hmm. never owned the property. Yeah. Simply yeah. assigned my contract. 65,188. Wow. Pretty massive payday. Um, my lowest has been 3,500. Mm-hmm. I average around 23 grand, 23 and a half. Um, my, my students nationwide, so some are in expensive markets, some are in much uh, less expensive markets. The average, the average works out to $9,600 on the wholesale fee. Wow. That's very interesting. That, I mean, that's, that's uh, very, very interesting. Uh, and does your marketing now over time, is there a, would you say it's a compound effect or would you actually say, no, you just got to set the budget aside and, you know, um, it's, it's kind of the cost of doing business and, and there is no true compound effect. Like I'm very curious because people hear marketing and they're like, well, you know, I told you you have a good brand and I don't know over time, does, do you feel that people are receptive to the marketing or do you feel that, it, you know, you know, what's the ROI, right? We're always so interested about the yeah. ROI. What are your, what are your take on that? Cause I know that's a very common question. I'm like, oh my gosh. You asked, yeah. You had asked me earlier, what were the, what was the number one thing? Uh, yeah. and, and I went for negotiation, but I told you I had a second, the, yeah. the, the second uh, secret sauce or magic potion, whatever the, the formula that people need is actually on the marketing side. It's the repetition. It, it's that mm-hmm. multiplication of effort. It, it's the fact that people don't, necessarily pay attention the first time they get a letter from you or a postcard from you or a phone call from you or the first time they see your ad in the newspaper or online. It, it, it's just not the way marketing works. So sometimes they respond, but most of the time there has to be some repetition. They, they've gotten your letter every month. They've gotten your postcard every quarter. They, they, they've, they've seen your ad every week. And then it, the funny thing is when they, you know, I, there's people that I have mailed, you know, probably seven, eight, nine, 10 times. And when they call, they swear it's the first time they've ever gotten it. <laughs> no, <laughs> I have their name in my database. I know how many times they've gotten, the, they've gotten my mailings, but they swear it's the first time they saw it. Well, it's not the first time they saw it. It's the first time it actually meant anything to them. Every other time they threw it in the trash because it was meaningless to them. They didn't need me right there and then. But then things change. And then there's a situation in their life or with their property or something's going wrong. And then my postcard arrives or my letter arrives and it speaks to them. I have the message to market match. And now mm. that you actually need it, it's kind of like, you know, when the, when the student's ready, the teacher will appear. Well, when the motivated mm-hmm. seller is ready, the investor appears, but they'll swear they've never seen you before. So it, it, it the, the secret, if there is one, the marketing is consistency, repetition, multiply your efforts. How, 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 like how often Tom, like, should I like, Am I going two years straight without a response? Am I going two months straight? Like what is, and I know there, maybe there isn't a secret sauce, but I, I've heard in marketing sometimes it's like, it takes seven touch points. Like what is your take on this after years yeah. of doing this at scale? Like yeah. what is that, you know, it, sweet spot, right? Yeah. And, 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 and I say that to encourage one maybe who is just starting out and they're like, oh, well, I launched my first campaign. I didn't get anything. Like yeah. I want you to give it to them straight here. Yeah. Now, if you went two years with nothing, there's a problem. So it, it's 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 response rate that changes. And when, when they talk about that seventh touch is the best time, that doesn't mean that's the only time you get responses. It means that that's your peak response rate. So you're always looking at response rate. You ought to be getting about a one percent response rate, which actually sounds pretty miserable. If you send out 100 letters, you're only expecting one response. This, but that means if you send out a thousand, you're expecting 10 responses. 
that's kind of pretty consistent across all different marketing types. Now, if you get into more specialty lists, you can raise that, but generally you're going to you know, reduce the volume that you're sending out. Let's say, I don't know, like people in probate. I, I'm lucky if I get 35, 40 a month on probate, but it has a higher, a higher response rate than 1%, which is great. So you, you're kind of playing that numbers game over time. You want to make sure you're getting some sort of response, which includes if it's negative. People might be calling saying, take me off your list. I'm not interested. How'd you get my name? They're responding, and that's important mm. to know because you can start talking to them and see what happens. Wow. What's the uh, – I got to ask you, there's two things I want to ask before we drop this because I could be on this call with you all day. I love this part. <laughs> um, number one is uh, when, you, when you think of – okay, so let me ask you. So how many – you know, at your peak, whether you're at your peak now or you're doing more consulting now or whether it was at your peak then or now, what is that number again with respect to where you're at? Because I don't want someone to hear this and be like, oh, I got to do it like Tom, right? So that we just said, where are you at now, right? So everyone has their respective starting point. But just for context, I always like to have, you know, we talk about being in those real groups where you'll hear something that will really inspire you. You'll be like, wow, I, I guess I'm playing the game small. What is a, you know, how many, is it mailers that we're using? Postcards, mailers? Is that is that what you're primarily, or you're doing Maybe that's, I should have opened up with that question. All of the above. So the above. I have I have postcards going out. It, it depends on the list. So mm -hmm. it depends who are you after, right? What market mm -hmm. are you after? Uh, it will depend on what do I send them? Letter, postcard, or do I reach them in another way? You know, door hanger, knock on a door, uh, drive for deals and, and look for rundown houses. There's a lot of different marketing sources. And then if I'm using direct mail, uh, there's a frequency to it. But that, that repetition might be, monthly, might be quarterly, uh, mm. might be weekly. Uh, if things like foreclosure in certain states, it, it can happen fast. If you, if, if you can lose a house in three weeks, uh, I don't have three months to mail you. I've got to mail, I, I mail you very fast. Uh, sometimes I'll, like some of that I'll do every other day for the, for the first week just wow. to kind of get their attention and jump out of the mail because that's not going on long term. But there's other sources, you know, probate. I do that monthly. Drip, drip, drip drip until they're ready to ready to talk to me and ready to contact me. So you're always matching your repetition cycle to the urgency of that type of problem that people are having. Oh, I love that. So my next question was going to be then, what has been that you're, you would say the biggest turnaround where you, you sit down with someone and you're like, hey, listen, I just want to know, like, how come you were just so against working with me and here we are now sitting at the signing table and maybe you don't preface it but that way but like just for motivation for someone who's listening be like i feel like i'm running to a wall what is that that light light at the end of the tunnel where you can share like some a case study of some kind where mm -hmm. this person were just if you were to look from the outside in there's just no shot you had no shot yeah. of moving forward and yeah. i just want to hear that and so someone else can hear it and be like okay great well if tom can overcome this maybe the, I'm, I'm facing the same thing right now and i must overcome by getting to the negotiation you got anything yeah. for us yeah i had a fellow it was great because the first time i talked to him he yelled at me called me names swore at me i was very derogatory about everything and then hung up okay so what did i do i went well, he's not ready right now, but I, I put, a, I put a, a tickler reminder on my calendar a month forward. I said, let's let him sit and stew for a month and see what happens. And then I called back. Like, hey, you know, we, we spoke a few weeks ago. <laughs> you know, not mentioning how awful it was. I, I, we spoke a few weeks ago. We, oh, I haven't sold yet. I, no, I'm in trouble now. Oh, really? Well, tell me about it. And now he's softening up a little and we start talking. And I, I didn't say much before the settlement. Afterwards, I said, hey, do you remember our very first phone call? You know, you, you weren't uh, you weren't terribly kind or polite to me. <laughs> I'm glad you're happy now. But, uh, you know, do you remember some of the names you called me? I mean, by that point, you had rapport and you were able to joke about it. Yeah. So I would say, good. I, I, I tell all my students, go, go get smacked in the face. Go get smacked in the face a lot. Because what's going to start to happen is you won't care anymore. Who cares what anyone anyone says? Mm. Who cares if they hang up? Who cares if they cuss you out? Who cares if they call you a name? You get over it, and then you follow up with them anyway. Because if anything, th their anger might actually be a sign that they're deeply frustrated. And mm. when you give a little more time to go by, and the time wrecks their situation even more, 
not, and, and they burn some of that anger out on everybody that they've yelled at. Uh, and, and then you call back because you're remembering to repeat and, and to multiply your efforts. You'll wind up with a deal. Mm. Against all odds. I like that. That's so good. That's like the marathon approach to this whole thing. And um, yeah, I love that. Mm. Tom, man, you you gave a lot of game today. That's uh, great. How can how can you know love again? We didn't even talk too much about it, but tell me about the traction real estate mentors. What it can do for us for listening. Uh, you know, I, I know you opened up this conversation with telling us what you do, but what can you do for us, and how can we you know work with you if you want to? Awesome. I teach people how to go from spinning their wheels to doing profitable deals. So I specifically take students from some are starting from scratch. Some are already in business, but kind of unhappy with the results they're getting or they realize they're, they're, they have no life left because they've wrapped themselves around the business. And so we restructure that. So mm -hmm. either way, whether you're, you're starting from scratch, we build it right. If we need to uh, break it down and rebuild it, we'll do that as well. To get you to, I'd like to bring people up to doing 100 grand in profits in a year, in 12 months. That's, mm -hmm. that's, my, that's my goal. And I always back it. I back that promise with a full refund guarantee as well. Love that. Love that. And where can we find out more about being able to work with you and your team? Two places to go. You can go to tractionrealestatementors.com, tractionrealestatementors.com. That's all on the training program. It's called Total Traction because that's what I want to get you to, Total Traction. Uh, and if you're specifically interested in the negotiation side of things, uh, my podcast is called uh, The Art and Science of Real Estate Negotiation. And that's at Tom Zeeb. Dot com tom z dot com is t-o-m z as in zebra e e b as in boy dot com love that love that and and just like you started it is chemistry it is uh, uh as like you said a science and an art and i would encourage uh everyone to to tap in uh because uh you know i think if you're able to uh, learn the science and then uh flex the muscle and, and work on the art, then really the world is yours. Then it's really you're, you've tapped into that superpower that we were talking about that um, in, in again, in any industry uh, that we should really be uh, kind of uh, tapping in and, and, and working on, on on a day to day. So uh, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. My goodness, for your time here. Time flew. I had, I mean, <laughs> even lost track of time here. This is how crazy how, how much information you're about to give, but we'll make sure that we give you a follow Make sure your audience checks that out. And just like that, we are out. Experiment Nation podcasting has changed the way we operate as real estate investors ourselves, and it can do the same for you. Podcasting has been the source of the master classes that we get thanks to the world class real estate investors and practitioners and specialists that come into the lab from all realms, from short-term rentals to mid-term rentals to real estate syndications to even software as a service, owners, founders, entrepreneurs have helped enrich our experiments by giving us the education, helping us build a network, and lastly, and most importantly, a brand association to open up multiple doors for our respective businesses. If you understand the power that podcasting can have and you know that you need one for your brand, please, you can rely on our team. InvestedTalent.com is my team and the team that helps this podcast, The Real Estate Experiment, become the fruition each and every single week to educate my community, build relationships on the air, and continue to build our brand. If you know that you need to do the same for your brand and you haven't pulled the trigger yet, maybe because you don't know how, our company, InvestedTalent.com, does the end-to-end -end from the time that you record to the time that it is published to even repurposing content on multiple social media platforms. That's what my team can do for you. Simply go to InvestedTalent.com and book a discovery call to see how my team can help you launch your podcast.